Hi, I'm Jade Lovell with PsyQ on the Young Turks Network. I'm here with Nancy Knowlton, a marine scientist at the Smithsonian. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Now, I wanted to get your take on this election so far. We're here at the science debate event. We're talking about science in the context of public dialogue in the election. So what has been your feeling about the quality of the debates so far? Well, in the science side of things, there's not been much science in the debates, honestly. Uh, we could use a little more science than the debates. Well, in that case, what question would you want to ask the candidates if you could? Well, I think the most pressing general question is, what are you going to do about climate change? Why do you think that's a good question to ask? Well, because it's a, it's, there are a lot of things you can do locally but uh, in terms of the environment, but something that has to be nationally and internationally is addressing climate change, so it's really important issue for the candidates to address. Now, why does a discussion on something like climate change matter in the context of the election? Why should the public care that those questions need to be asked? I think the public should care how the candidates think about issues and whether they relate to facts and, and how you take those facts and turn them into policy decisions. Uh, if you completely ignore the facts, then you're unlikely to come up with a good policy. Now, tell us a little bit about your role at the Smithsonian, and does government regulation or things that the president could control ever impact on your work as a scientist? I don't think that government uh, directly affects that much about my work as a scientist. Obviously, any government agency has rules and regulations about how to do things, but it's not, it's not a an oppressive or detailed aspect. It's the sort of, they're really the sort of rules that you'd want to follow anyway. Now, Nancy, I know you're in charge of an, uh, a movement called Earth Optimism. Can you tell me a little bit about that movement and why you came up with it? Well, um, I came up with Earth Optimism and actually before then, Ocean Optimism, because as an environmental scientist, I spent several decades telling people that the world was coming to an end, and I eventually realized that the world coming to an end without any solutions to have it not come to an end was pretty pointless, and so I started focusing on the solutions. I found out there were actually tons of solutions, and that's what led to Ocean Optimism and now Earth Optimism. Tell us a little bit about the good news. Can you give me one or two case studies that we can be, because sometimes we get a bit doom and gloom as well, talking about we need more science. Tell me one or two uh, great examples of positive, optimistic things. Well, it, there are a lot of positive, optimistic things that we've done in terms of protecting spaces. All sorts of new marine protected areas have been established, including very large ones in the last couple of uh, years. Lots of examples. One just this week about how sea eagles in Scotland were thought to be or were extinct in the wild uh, and have been reintroduced and their numbers are surging. So lots of examples like that. And also plenty of examples in terms of progress being made in the climate uh, greenhouse grass front as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You're asking a question later at this very important event, so we're really looking forward to hearing that.